Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. And as we're coming up on holidays that are celebrated in many places around the globe, um, we have a treat for you coming from France, from uh, the Curie Institute um, in, um, in the way of Antonin Morillon, who's gonna be sharing with us some of his results on prostate cancer and EVs that are containing link RNAs um, and some other RNAs. Um, so Antonin, thanks so much for joining today. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And before I hand the mic over to you, I'm just going to um, ask that everybody please put your comments and questions in the chat box. Um, and then we will allow unmuting at the end so that you can interact with Antonin. So uh, over to you, Antonin. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ken, for the invitation. Um, thank you very much, everybody, to be there today. Um, Two days ago, it was difficult for me to make a talk because of the, the, the football match, as you know, but today is much better. So I'm, I'm ready to, to go into uh, science. So I'm gonna share my screen. What I'm going to do um, is to talk about um, long non-coding RNA and cell-to-cell -cell communication. So first, so the, the, my talk will be divided in three parts. The first part, um, uh, will be a, a large introduction on uh, the non-coding genome and long non-coding RNAs, what we know uh, today. Um, then we're going to move to uh, published data that we have um, uh, produced uh, and published this year on uh, a comparison of uh, the, the full transc the total transcriptome between um, urinary um, extracellular vesicle and tumors from prostate cancer patients. And then I will navigate in the, in the last part on um, using um, unreferenced RNAs as biomarkers for uh, prostate cancer still in the, in the urines of the, of the patients. So what I'm going to, to, to start with is um, the idea that 99% of uh, our genome is uh, non-coding. Uh, and uh, this um, has a very um, has raised a lot of interest uh, recently uh, because this non-coding genome is indeed transcribed into non-coding RNAs or long non-coding RNAs are uh, specific classes of these non-coding RNAs. And these RNAs can have functional uh, significance in the cells, uh, controlling the gene expression mostly. And this has been shown in the nucleus uh, from epigenetic transcription and splicing events up to in the cytoplasm where they can control in some case uh, RNA stability, uh, titrates, some microRNAs and also be translated uh, into uh, small peptides or micropeptides. And so um, today I'm going to touch a little bit uh, this type of function and uh, especially the last one, which is the less, um, um, I, let's say, um, understood today. Um, so um, the non-coding, the dark side of the genome or the pervasive transcription of the, of the genome um, can um, generate uh, a large variety of uh, long non-coding RNAs that have very different uh, features. Uh, and they can be classified uh, depending of, on their sequence on, uh, of origin, on their localization in the genome. And so in this slide, what I show is a, a, a little glimpse of the different families of link RNAs that can be found in human cells, in human genome. So eRNA for enhancer RNAs, um, uh, antisense cryptic transcripts such as the prompt RNA, antisense link RNA, the NAT into the open reading frame, uh, telomere uh, link RNA for Tera, uh, and so on. They can be repetitive RNAs or uh, unique RNAs. So again, the, the, the image the people use in the field is the, the iceberg, um, meaning that this, uh, the, the, the transcriptome, uh, the coding transcriptome is um, what we can see from the iceberg and the non-coding transcriptome is the, uh, uh, let's say the um, non, um, 
visible part of the, 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 the transcriptome. And as for the iceberg, this is very important for the maintenance and the uh, expression regulation uh, of the genome. So a large part of the work in the field is to uh, illuminate this dark genome or this uh, dark matter of the genome to try to understand the function of these RNAs and what they do in the cell. So most of these RNAs are uh, repetitive uh, sequence. Uh, and uh, for the 40% remaining, uh, they can be dispersed in the different category as described on this, uh, uh, this uh, um, picture. The second specificity of these uh, link RNAs um, is their um, um, specificity in cell type and specificity in tissues. And this has been first uh, largely uh, shown by the ENCODE um, work in 2012, uh, where on uh, 14 different cell lines, um, uh, it was shown that most of the messenger RNA uh, represented in the, in the red uh, diagram here uh, are expressed in all the cell lines. Of course, there will be a series of messenger RNA that are specific to each of the cell lines, making the identity of the cells. Um, but this is a very different story for the link RNAs, which for the vast majority of them, they are expressed in only one cell lines. So uh, on the series of 12,000 um, of link RNA at the time, um, uh, you have 2,000 per cell lines that are expressed. So most of them are expressed in only one cell lines. Again, pointing the idea that they might participate to the cellular identity. In terms of chronology and how they have been uh, discovered and described over the years, everything starts at the beginning of the molecular biology, where the first RNAs that were studied at the time in the 50s and 60s are non-coding RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, tRNAs, SNO RNAs. Um, and this is only in the 90s um, uh, or late 80s that single regulatory link RNA or small non-coding RNA were uh, uh, described and uh, some of the mechanism shown. So this is the case in bacteria for MIGF, H19, XIST, LIN4, and 93 etc. And then um, the, the field changed uh, by the emergence of genomic uh, approach and macroarrays, first tiling arrays, and then sequencing and systematic sequencing. We are now into the single cellomic, of course, and this has really generated an explosion of uh, uh, the different category of uh, non-coding RNAs that can be uh, described. We, in my lab, we participate to a subclass of this uh, long non-coding RNA, uh, which belong to the cryptic side. So you have the non-coding uh, RNAs and you have the cryptic non-coding RNA. So it's even further hidden into the different layers of uh, the transcriptome. But anyway, so we describe this in yeast uh, for uh, this uh, link RNA called the XUT for uh, they are very sensitive to an exonuclease called the XRN1 uh, nuclease. Um, so now there is thousands and thousands of link RNA. Uh, and um, uh, this year, uh, this is a graph that uh, has been shown recently, um, we reach an historical point where the number uh, in the gen code version, the last uh, version of gen code, uh, the number of non-coding genes has reached the number of coding genes. So it's not an exception anymore. Uh, we are now officially in the same, uh, in the same pace. Um, but this is not uh, the end of the story, of course. And because they are cellular tissues specific, um, it has raised a lot of interest in developmental uh, field, but also in the cancer uh, research. And here, this is um, uh, an illustration of the different catalogs that have been produced over the years, where the numbers of link RNAs can be more than 60,000 of different genes. So this is the case uh, from the My Transcriptome uh, initiative or project in 2015, 2017, where they compare tumors versus uh, LC tissues 
from 12 tumors. And they could show by differential expression analysis that uh, you have high specificity of different link RNAs that can be upregulated in this different category of tumors here or downregulated in these different categories. Um, in 2021, the RNA atlas from Peter Mesdag have shown, have shown even more and, and deep differences between these link RNAs that can be cell lines, uh, tissue specific here. You can see the numbers are just amazing. But what is shown even more interestingly is that um, the structure of this link RNA can be different. The processing can be different. For the very same link RNA or the very same antisense link RNA here, you can see that some of them uh, can be polyadenylated in some of the tissues or non-polyadenylated in other tissues, which means a lot for uh, this link RNA function because, of course, the polyadenylation will control different aspects of their fate, translation possibly, but also uh, the transport from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. Um, and more recently, uh, there is uh, an enormous uh, effort into trying to define the precise function of this link RNA and to list the functional uh, the function of the, the, these link RNAs. And so this is the cancer link RNA census from Rory Johnson, uh, who has uh, used a, a latest version of a tumor sequencing approach. I don't remember if 2,000 or 3,000 tumors were sequenced. And so in addition to describe all the link RNAs within these different tumors, so more or less the same as what has, done, has been done in my transcriptome approach, he also look at um, the capacity of this link RNA to have an oncogenic uh, function or tumor suppressor function. And he defined at the time 130 of this link RNA having a function in cancer and the catalog has been um, uh, updated recently and they have reached now for um, 400 and so uh, of link RNA having a function. So they call them cancer link RNA census. So what could be the function of this link RNA? This is represented by the schematic view of what they could do. Uh, very classic, but I just list a few examples of these guys that can do this type of uh, regulation. So they can control chromatin compaction by bringing uh, two uh, domains of, chrom of chromatin together. This could be the role of the eRNA or enhancer RNAs. They could uh, um, tether uh, chromatin remodeling or transcription factor or histone modification um, uh, close to a promoter region, for instance, or a specific domain. Uh, in terms of RNA RNA interactions, they can have uh, different function to control the stability, the translation, um, the whatever you want by uh, tethering something on the RNA uh, or titrating something. And also in terms of scaffolding, this is more like the classic view, like the ribosome, for instance, uh, where uh, they, uh, in addition to have a catalytic activity, they can also bring different protein together and make a complex stable or active or inactive, uh, if you want. So different domains have been touched uh, in terms of uh, regulation, especially uh, ex gene expression regulation from DNA uh, um, uh, activity to RNA activity, as I, I told you, up to the protein uh, expression translation control. So different domains from epigenetic to uh, repair, everything that touched DNA at the end, DNA metabolism, chromosome looping, uh, replication, telomere metabolism. Um, one of the most famous link RNA in cancer field is HOTER, which has been first shown uh, to be expressed uh, and, and study um, um, in developmental studies, actually in mouse. Uh, this is expressed in different tissues, uh, but what is really interesting is that in metastatic breast cancer, it's overexpressed, largely overexpressed. And uh, from this observation, um, uh, the study published in Nature in 2010 now, it's a long time ago, uh, when cloned and overexpressed in cells and the cells injected into a uh, mouse, it can trigger uh, cancer in the mouse. So it has one of the first that has been shown to have an oncogenic activity. 
Um, so I told you that this is not the only example, and now there is an effort to have a complete uh, view of this uh, functional cancer-related uh, link RNA. So as I said, 490 link RNA have been shown to have this function. So this is an effort where the group of Rowan Johnson uh, cloned this RNA, make gain and loss of function, uh, check for a phenotype uh, in cells, and uh, basically to make these classifications. It's a very important work and very uh, uh, interesting for the community. So a series of examples have been uh, shown uh, for the mechanism of action uh, and uh, their role into the different hallmarks of cancer. It has only six of the hallmarks of cancer. And so naturally, I would say, uh, this link RNA become very interesting to understand to be driver of cancer, of course, to be biomarkers. And so at the end of the day, to be a novel target for a therapeutic purpose. So everything I show you is within the cell. Um, and of course, uh, over the years and, and, and quite recently, um, this non-coding RNA world also migrate uh, into the extracellular vesicle or extracellular uh, compartment of the cells, if we can say this way. Um, and there is a, a, a numerous, uh, work and, and different papers that show that indeed uh, they could be uh, found in these extracellular vesicles uh, and that they can have actually a function to, um, to in the acceptor cells that may be to control uh, gene expression, the same that they could do uh, in the original uh, donor cells. Um, however, all of this work have been done either on one tissue on one uh, sample um, only or only on poly A plus RNA or only on small non-coding RNAs. Um, some of them were done um, without knowing if we are talking about uh, extracellular RNAs or uh, uh, into the extracellular vesicle and what type of vesicle and so on. So the, the, there was a need um, to, uh, to be more precise in what we say. And uh, so with Clotilde Thierry, we decided to start this project by uh, looking at uh, urines, uh, extracellular vesicle, and properly enriched and extracted, and to compare systematically what the contents, the total RNA contents of these vesicles uh, with uh, the content of the very same tumor of the very same patient. So we have a cohort of patients that we are currently uh, analyzing in my lab to actually uh, go into the direction of biomarkers. And so by doing so, we wanted to have a better idea of what each of the tumor could produce. So we take six of the patients, uh, their tumor and their urines, and we compare total transcriptome for all of them. So this is the uh, modus operandi here that uh, I show you. So this is in collaboration with uh, Mondo Hospital that provide us with this cohort of patients. So as I say, we extract the RNA from uh, FFP uh, samples of six patients and uh, six urines of the same patients before, of course, uh, the biopsy, uh, the urine had, has been collected at the, without any, anything else, or so just after a prostatic massage. And we uh, add to this uh, um, POC study um, uh, three cell lines, um, three prostate cancer cell lines, and they are uh, extracellular vesicles that we can collect from the, the gross media. So we use, uh, uh, so we carefully made the extraction of the extracellular vesicle control uh, under the control and the supervision of, uh, of Clotilde to try to be the, mo the most uh, precise possible at the time. So it's an, an ultra centrifugation uh, protocol and uh, NTA uh, electron microscopy and Western blood controlled. And, uh, and then we use low input 
um, uh, total RNA sequencing approach after ribosomal depletion. So this is the, 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 the picture we could get so with three species, three types of RNA, circular RNAs here in uh, orange. Uh, green for the link RNAs and the gray are the, the other types of RNAs. This is the tumor and this is the 2D plots uh, comparing for each of these genes um, uh, their enrichments between the two, uh, the two types. So this is the, 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 the average or the mean of the six patients uh, and six urines. As you can see already on this graph, the orange is much more going into the uh, urinary EVs than the, in the tumor. So suggesting that there is a strong enrichment of this category of RNAs. But if we do things more prop properly in terms of statistics, we use differential uh, expression analysis and DSEC2, uh, and we compare the different biotypes of RNAs. And you can see that on the right is the enrichment into the urines, uh, and this is the enrichment into the tumor on the left. And you can see that uh, some of, RNA are of the RNA are clearly more enriched into the tumors than in the EVs, uh, but some of them are really enriched into the, into the tumors. So if you take the best of them uh, and you make a cutoff uh, statistics, uh, cutoff and fold enrichment, you get the, uh, something like 300, um, circular RNAs and uh, 274 link RNAs that are enriching EVs. And this is the one I will focus on today. Um, we had six uh, tumors and six urinary EVs. And so we wanted to know whether the enrichment we could have was something that we could reproduce on other patients. So we took 20 more samples of urines, we sequenced the urines, and we project uh, the expression of these uh, uh, circular RNA enriched by the first uh, clustering between uh, the, two, the tumor and the urines. And you can see that the pink, which are these patients, also are enriched in these different types. So there is a good robustness in the fact that this is an enrichment. And actually, if you take one by one all of these gene circular or link RNA, and you plot one patient by patient, the tumor and the urine, you can see that this is systematically the case. There is a large enrichment each time of these different genes. So the first question we ask was, what are these RNA? What is the the, 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 the features of these RNAs. And we uh, first look at the intron exon. Um, and as you can see on this metagene, where we plot the two first exon and the last one and the different intron, so last and the first, you can see that the number of tags that go into the exon and introns are very different. And the scale from intron and exon are very different. So don't, uh, don't be... Um, um, don't don't I don't want to uh, to to miscon to 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 misdrive you on the interpretation of the data. It's very low uh, into the entrance, but you can see that for the two more signals, we have a higher signals in the intron than in, for the EVs, and uh, this is completely the reverse for the exon, where there are higher signal in the EVs in the exonic uh, RNAs. So this support the idea that the EVs. Uh, contain mature RNA, completely processed RNA. And actually, if you take one example of this uh, gene, GPH1 here on the bottom of the slide, you can see that the total RNA-seq um, give you some signals within the introns, which is completely normal. Uh, but as, as soon as you are in the urinary EVs transcriptome, it's a, it's a clean uh, exonic transcriptome. So uh, for us, uh, it's the indication of a processed RNA. So of course, processed RNA are the RNA in the cytoplasm. So we wanted to know whether we had enrichment of RNAs that are in the cytoplasm. And this is the case. Indeed, we use data sets uh, of people that have done fractionation uh, of the cells. We use uh, prostate cancer cell lines to, for, for that. And you can see that if in the tumor, um, the signal, the total RNA signals uh, are mostly into the nucleus for link RNA and pseudogene. It's not the case for messenger RNA in the cytoplasm. This is quite normal. But for the urinary EVs, most of the signals are cytoplasmic uh, signals. Uh, 
So now the question is the function of this RNA. Can we define subcategories? Can we define the number of this link or circular RNAs that we found in enriched in the EVs to be functional? Uh, so we start with the circular RNAs and uh, we uh, use the different data we had from the cell lines and the patients. Um, and uh, most, more importantly, we use uh, data that were uh, published in 2019, um, where they define a functional essential circular RNA for cell proliferation. So this is a beautiful paper, actually, where there was a, um, a screen um, for these functionalities for all the circular RNA they could find in prostate cancer and uh, in the cell. And so they end up with a list of 171 essential circular RNA. So we cross compare this list with the one that we had from the urinary EVs uh, and the cellular uh, EVs. And we end up with 14 of these circular RNAs having a functional significance defined by this paper. So um, this is the list here. This is one example of uh, circular RNAs which circularize between two exons for this coding gene. And you can see that in the tumor, the signals are almost very, uh, very low compared to the urinary EVs, which is very high. And this is the case for all the cells. So we believe that these circular RNAs uh, if they have the capacity to reach another cells and be delivered into the, these cells, they might have the same function uh, that they could titrate, they could trigger the same response from the cells as it has been defined in this work, if the quantity is sufficient, of course. The second type of example are the link RNA. Uh, so as I told you, um, um, uh, cancer link RNA census the number two catalog defined uh, 492 link RNA having a function. So we cross compare again this list and we end up with 25 of these link RNA that are enriched into the, into the urinary EVs. And this is, I mean, super enrichment actually, if you do the, the stat. Um, and so, I mean, this is an example, PCAT6 here, which has been already uh, shown by uh, my transcriptome to be a prostate cancer associated transcript. This is the name of this transcript. It's highly expressed, I mean, highly enriched into the urinary EVs, as you can see on this, uh, on this plot. Some of these uh, cancer cell lines also show the same. And this has been, uh, uh, this link RNA is important for proliferation and invasion. It has been shown in prostate cancer, breast cancer, and lung cancer. So again, we, we propose that this link RNA, if they reach uh, a cells, another cells, they could also play the same role in the cells. But in addition to this function that is really, let's say, well known in the link RNA uh, field, um, there has been uh, this last two or three years, uh, a start of a revolution where the non-coding world become coding. And so this is coming to, from the idea that some of the link RNA can be found in the cytoplasm. And I show you today that this is the case. They can even go into the extracellular vesicule. And so being in the cytoplasm, being processed, being pol 2 capped and polyadenylated, they have everything to be bound by the ribosome. And indeed, there is plenty of small off, plenty of micropeptide that can be produced by this. And so there has been a paper um, uh, I, recently where they uh, basically screened for this open reading frame in link RNAs for cancer. And they found a lot of them having a role actually in the cancer progression. But anyway, so for us, um, this is very interesting because this link RNA being processed, uh, being exported, they might also be translated into the cells and they might produce a peptide that have a function or a peptide that can be used as a neoantigen uh, by the major histocompatibility complex. So this is an entire field and I don't want to touch too much on that, but um, we ask this question. So we ask whether uh, the uh, link RNA that we have enriched in the uh, urinary EVs uh, contain open reading frame, are translated in cells and could be um, uh, excellent uh, binding 
um, peptide for uh, the MHC class one or class two, in this case, class one. And so uh, we um, didn't do ribosic experiments for this uh, study, um, but we use a data set that were produced in PC3 cell line, which is a prostate cancer cell line. And we use this data to cross compare uh, the one, the, 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 the open reading frame and, uh, and this link RNA in the vesicles. In addition to that, we predict the affinity of the, 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 the potential peptide for the MHC class one. So there is a script which is called the net MHC pan um, uh, script that do this prediction quite, quite well, actually. And so we could define 15 link RNAs that have a, a, an open reading frame that have a very high prediction by the net, um, the net script that can be found also in the PC3 cell lines. So we could compare for these 15 uh, link RNAs, we could compare their signal with ribosic. And so if some of them have a signals, which doesn't say that the other one are not translated, but at least with this, with this ribosic experiments, they were not detected. We also perform mass spectrometry analysis to look for the peptide. And again, it's not, uh, it doesn't say that the other one uh, are not uh, translated, but we couldn't detect uh, by mass spec. And um, we uh, could isolate one guy, for instance, this one with a high prediction in net, being in urinary um, uh, vesicles, uh, being translated by actively translated by ribosic in cell lines, and having a peptide that we could uh, uh, propose as a, an excellent neoantigen if translated uh, and uh, uh, put on the surface of the cells. So, again, this is only. Um, um, speculation. We didn't do immunopeptidomic here. Yeah? It's only prediction and uh, speculation based on several data and, uh, uh, and mass spec experiments. So we end up with uh, these three conclusions with this work that we published this year. Uh, link RNA um, and rich in EVs um, uh, actually are cytoplasmic link RNAs mostly. Some of them can be uh, functional and uh, transfer, can be transferred via uh, the, the urines and the fluids, and they can be uh, they can be translated. So the 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 the, the little model that we the naive model that I propose already uh, during my talk is that these link RNAs uh, could be exported to an acceptor cells. And um, in the cells, they could perform if they could, if the proteins, the factors, the environment is, is, uh, is sufficient for them, they could perform their regulatory role that could be changing the, uh, the genetic program or the cellular identity. But they could also produce peptide and they could uh, uh, produce neoantigen to these cells that might not be cancer cells and that could be uh, or trigger uh, an immune response uh, if, uh, if possible. So we propose that EV link, link RNAs could be active players in cell to cell reprogrammation and identity. So now um, I'm going to, if I have some time, so I did it this morning, I, I'm, I'm the limit. So I, I will finish on that. I will not present the biomarker aspects. Um, I just want to. Um, can you okay Antonin, Antonin, if you want yeah. to, feel free. Feel free to go ahead if you if you'd like okay. to share more. Okay. Okay. So I just I just want to to share with you um, some ideas and some and some uh, calculation we have made recently based on publication. Probably some of you guys have done it already in, in your lab. Just to to exchange on that. So ju just to everything I told you today, um, if. If there is an action of this RNA from one cell to another, the RNA has to be intact. Otherwise, I mean, it's losing a little bit of its sense. Even if we are talking about small peptides, small open reading frames, I mean, the size is, is, does matter in this case. And, and if you do the math, if you do the calculation, if you look at the um, uh, bioanalyzer of the quality of the RNA that you extract from this extracellular vesicle, you end up with small RNAs. I still don't know if the small RNAs are, are uh, due to what is inside this uh, vesicle or because of the extractions. I have no idea of that. Um, but in terms of size, what is possible? 
if you take a volume of cells, this is the number. If you take the volume of EVs, more or less, you have this range, if I'm not completely uh, wrong. Um, different papers and measurements. And now if you take RNAs, if you take RNAs, this is the different RNA one. I mean, this, this has been published also. This is the, the volume occupied by different types of RNAs from small to large RNAs and uh, with the duration radius. I don't know if you say that in English, but basically volume has been assessed. And you can end up with this uh, calculation of a volume of naked RNA, absolutely compact, uh, that could occupy this type of space. Uh, so if you end up with that, you, you could have 2,000, 2 kb long RNA compacted into uh, the vesicle, um, which means that total RNA is ribosomal RNA mostly, 60 messenger RNA. If you, if you take this, it's a, it's a complete proxy, okay? And it's completely stupid at the end because it's a very compact, almost a block, uh, we are not talking about face-to-face -face transition. It's like a granulum that is really, really solid. So it's not, uh, for me, it's not possible. For me, um, the extracellular vesicle should be a mini cell. So it, it's a kind of uh, the same space occupied by DRNA proteins, RNPs uh, inside the uh, EVs should be a mini cell for me. And so I made the calculation in different way. Uh, and so by doing the ratio between these two uh, cell volume and, and EVs volume, I end up with something which is more like 20 total RNAs uh, in one EV that might represent one third, um, one, no, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 messenger and 0.6 messenger RNA per small EVs. So this is my approximation. So it means that in one EVs, it's very difficult to have a full size uh, messenger RNA, it's possible, but it might be very difficult. So this is my view. Maybe we can discuss this later. I'm going to finish on the biomarker aspect, um, but this was my, my point of view. So everything I told you uh, has to be a, a large uh, molecule of uh, link RNAs. Circular RNAs are different stories. They are shorter and they are more compact because of the circularization of them. So maybe we could have more, maybe this calculation could be different. So just a few slides on cancer, on prostate cancer. Uh, so we use our expertise and sequencing approach to look for biomarkers. So I will, I'll be, I will be very short on this prostate cancer. Everybody knows uh, the different risk. And the need of uh, today for a non-invasive um, um, biopsy of prostate cancer to, to have a, 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 um, um, an early diagnosis or prognosis of uh, the prostate cancer or an active uh, surveillance of uh, patients. So the urine is a, is a great uh, fluid for that. Um, prostate um, will have, a, will deliver cells and uh, EVs into the urines, as I show you. Um, and we could use the transcriptome, uh, the full transcriptome approach to look for these. And the originality of our approach, and this is my point, this is the key point of the, the message I will give to you now. It, I, I, I will not conclude on biomarkers and I will explain in a minute, but the way we approach this problem is not to look as the classic way. We don't look at the annotation. We are not looking, we are not mapping our reads into uh, an annotated genome. We don't take gene code for that. So this is the classic approach. People look for after messenger RNA polyase sequencing, in our case, it's gonna be total RNA, but they align to the genome and look for genes annotation, select probes, make gene-based classifier and uh, diagnostic kit. You lose information on that. So we wanted to have a disruptive approach using uh, unreference uh, an alignment-free uh, methodology I described very, very quickly here that we already use and publish and others also, we are not the only one. So we use total RNA-seq from the urines and we use the k approach. The k is only, um, it's a 30 nucleotide long uh, tag that we extract from the sequencing reads, okay? And so we take a 31 mare, which is exactly what you need to, uh, to, to know where it is in the genome. And we don't align. We just compare our different uh, cohort of patients, the, the LC patient versus cancer patients, for instance, and we only keep those 
uh, contigs or k-mers that have a different, highly differential uh, uh, profile uh, compared uh, in, in comparison between the two conditions. We use machine learning and, and we have k-mers. So this has an advantage. It can approach non-annotated genes, splicing variants that are not uh, uh, catalog into gen code. Mutated form of RNAs. In cancer, it's very interesting. SNPs, rearrangement, genetic variations such as repeat, and of course, circular RNAs or non annotated link RNAs. So the cohort is uh, one of the patients. Uh, we have uh, 86 trans um, um, tr transcriptome. And this is what we can get. So this is uh, uh, the cohort of patients, the tumoral patients, you can see. So this is unsupervised. You can see that with the signature of 18 uh, K-mers here, or contigs, because we contig these K-mers at the end, we can end up with a very clean separation between the two groups of patients. So um, of course, the, 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 so this is a discovery cohort. Um, and we wanted to, so if you compare with the annotated RNAs, for instance, if you do the classic way, you can't. I mean, you, you, you have no, no way to discriminate the two categories of patients. Even if you use PCA3, which has been uh, shown to be a, um, uh, an RNA that is a good indication for prostate cancer, it's not good. PCA3 will be very, very good for mild cancer and very bad for aggressive cancer, which is a, which is a problem for a biomarker. So we wanted to evaluate this model. So we don't have, uh, we are building it right now, but we don't have a validation cohort. So we use um, uh, here a way, so a work curve sensitivity and specificity on the very same cohort. So which is completely, you don't, you don't want to see that, okay? So you forget about this. But for us, it was a good way first to confirm that we are 100% uh, specificity and, 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 and sensitivity, which is fantastic. But uh, we could compare uh, what we could get with the other markers that people have proposed for cancer prostate. And you see PCA3, which is a um, FDA approved uh, biomarker, it's very far away from our reference. So now we are using an independent code. So uh, I don't want you to have a false impression. It's just a first idea. I just want to finish there. Thank you very much for uh, having with me uh, uh, along all the time. I want to thank uh, my team, the people on this slide, uh, my collaborators, Clotilde at the end of my corridor, uh, Daniel Gautre for the k approach and our supplier for uh, prostate cancer uh, tissues and urines, our sponsors, and of course you for being still there with me tonight. Thank you very much. We will actually have our discussion moderated today by somebody from my lab who has special interests in RNA um, and who has worked a lot with viruses. So maybe we'll hear a little bit about how viruses package their RNA. And um, we can think about that because of the uh, the close similarities between envelope viruses anyway and, and EVs. Thanks, Ken. And uh, great talk. Dr. Morion, um, before we get into the the chat questions, I had I had a quick question that I wanted to ask um, about mechanisms of uh, non coding RNA loading into the EVs. Um, given that you given that you saw enrichment in in uh, some of these EVs coming out of the prostate cancer in, in the urine, um, enrichment implies some sort of you know mechanism for 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 getting those RNAs into the EV. So, do you have any speculations on on how these uh, non coding RNAs are being loaded? Yeah, so only speculation. I think this is the right term. Um, we, we we are looking for a motif. Uh, I mean, the the the, the, diff the story in the Nature paper published last year, I suppose, uh, for microRNAs, where there is this um, uh, this uh, sequence uh, that is really important. This motif that make this RNA to be uh, to be into the EVs. Um, so we look for that. We look for motif enrichment. We we couldn't find something. Uh, I have to say, and uh, and again, I mean, I, the speculation. So this is first. I I can't say now. If you take this slide that I have there, where I speculate on the idea that we have pieces of RNAs, and so at the end we have a full transcriptome. We have tags all along the RNAs, and there is it's not like one tag. It's everything on the RNA has been touched by the by the sequencing. So it means that at least. If there are pieces of RNA everywhere in different EVs, they all should have the same motif uh, to, to be enriched. So, so 
I still can't figure out things there. And I have to say, I'm a little bit lost and I don't know. Uh, but what I can say is that there is an enrichment. It's robust. Um, uh, we can see some of this enrichment also in cellular EVs, so from in vitro experiments. So there is something. Uh, what? I don't know. I don't know. Thanks. Thanks for your response. Um... Okay, now we can get into some of the chat questions. So I think the first one came from uh, Dr. Arab. Tanina, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question you had about uh, comparing different sources of the uh, RNA? Sure, thank you so much. It was a really wonderful talk. Thank you so much for putting it together. I was just wondering to like stay within the same level of complexity if you um, consider uh, comparing not uh, tumors tissue to uh, urine EVs, but rather urine EVs to EVs derived from the tissue or the other way around the tissue to the urine directly. Um, just because of the complexity of composition of these two samples. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so this is why we really went back to cellular uh, experiments um, where we use these three different cell lines to have an idea of what we say and what we could find. Uh, we also um, um, compare at the messenger RNA level, um, uh, the kidney uh, and uh, the bladder specific RNAs to see, I mean, what, 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 how good we are in terms of uh, um, uh, homogeneity or heterogeneity of the, of the EVs. And actually, because we do a massage, and uh, don't forget we do a prostate massage for these patients, um, we believe that this is a way to really release a lot of this material into the urine. So this is just before uh, urine is, uh, is, uh, is um, taken. Um, so it might be a very different story um, if we had uh, just um, like no massage at all and it would be a mix of, uh, this is the case, for instance, in blood, it's a nightmare. So, so this is what I'm, uh, the, the only thing I can tell on this, uh, on this, uh, on this aspect. Right, we have another question from uh, Kevin about uh, RNA vaccines. So Kevin, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. You know, as I was sitting here listening to this, it, we see and hear reports in the field of unexpected, you know, responses to the new RNA vaccine sometimes. And it just occurred to me, what if there are these non-coding sequences kind of embedded in the viral sequence that people haven't bothered to, to look at? And what's the likelihood based on your experience and what you know about these kinds of coding uh, sequences to be also potentially um, generated um, in response uh, of the cells to the, the vaccines? And could that be a potential safety risk? I, uh, so this is only I can I can only speculate on that. I have no uh, I can't I can't tell you uh, if this is clear that if if you want to um, um, link RNAs and and um, circular RNAs, especially the enhancer RNAs, they are really really sensitive to the genetic program. So if you have any stress, any conditions that will challenge the cell, you will change the link RNA composition into the cell. So uh, any stress for the cells uh, will have uh, a response into the cells. It could be very transient. It would be very quick. This RNA can be cryptic, um, plenty of things, but yes, there will be a response. But to go for, I mean, we have, so for instance, we have a project today where we look into um, uh, lung cells, human lung cells, um, uh, in um, in uh, presence of the SARS-CoV-2, uh, and we sort the cells uh, that have been infected and compare with this, the very same population of cells which are not infected by the virus but have been in contact with it, and we compare the link RNA world in the two type of cells, and this is just amazing to yeah. change in every direction. So that's that's an interesting angle that I think probably a lot of us had, haven't considered. So thank you, thank you for your talk today. It was uh, excellent. Han Leong had a question about uh, selection of the cohorts. 
Yeah, I guess, you know, to preference my question, um, you know, the six patients you had, two of them were Gleason 3 plus 3. And then you're able to put together this um, panel, right? And then I looked in your supplementary information, PCA3 is there. And um, so, you know, it's interesting to me that these are, these are long non coding RNAs and post-DRE samples, right? And then you're still finding that they're specific not only for something that's barely cancer, like three plus three, and something that's above that. And so, you know, I'm a little concerned because, you know, you did it, you applied that panel on your lasso PCA3. And so I'm just wondering, you know, do you, like, what was that cohort like? Like the 112 patients, like, were there any Gleason 3 plus 3s? Because, you know, those are cancers that our institute and Johns Hopkins has shown that, you know, we should not be picking up. Yeah, so... Um... So, so, so the, the, this is a discovery core. So um, the, the, what we have there is there is a range of um, different uh, Gleason grade of mm -hmm. the patient. So this is for sure. We have the biopsy and we have the clinical data for that. But we don't have LC. So this, the, the norm, what I call the normal here, uh, it's a proxy. This is hyperplasic patient, uh, prostates, hyperplasia of prostate. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we don't have real LC, LC patients. So this is why I just want, for me, mm -hmm. it's an illustration here only of the way we are looking at it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, we have to be careful of what uh, type of patient we, we do. And the lasso here uh, is without PCA3. You have uh, noticed oh. well. Oh, the mice. <laughs> uh, because we wanted to have something that is... Uh, let's say, because we found PCA3. With this k yeah. approach, you have plenty of signals that goes into yeah. the PCA3 also. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying PCA3 is not a good uh, marker, but it mm -hmm. goes down and down. You probably know that, down and down with the aggressivity and the Gleason score, which is higher. Um, yeah, I mean, but yes, when I looked at your data, like it's, it's comforting to see that PCA3 is quite high and then it's kind of dovetails with the tissue, right? But then with the tissue, you know, you know, there's not a lot of clinical data, like how many cores, what percentage of the cores had cancer versus not, and to still see this robust signature. And, you know, these are men that are individual, sorry, that are undergoing um, a DRE, right, for suspicion of disease. So not all of them will have cancer. So therein also is the opportunity to get their post-DRE samples where there is no evidence of prostate cancer to do your healthy, normal cohort, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, I'm seeing from Christian Neri um, in the chat asking a question about uh, stress response. Christian, would you like to unmute? Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, Anthony. Uh, really inspiring talk. Um, you mentioned that this uh, link RNA could mediate pathogenic pro-tumor effects or, um, so to speak, homeostatic effect, uh, possibly uh, activating an immune response, right? Yeah. And uh, so I have a general question. Could you elaborate on what is the knowledge, the current knowledge on the role of this uh, link RNA in stress response, um, in cellular, in promoting cellular resilience? Um, what is the, the knowledge there? Uh, it's very, uh, very low, very low knowledge. Um, why is that? Um, the reason, so the, the, the reason, so the reason is coming from the original, let's say, ID and uh, that everybody um, more or less uh, recapitulate in his own lab is the fact that these link RNAs, they are um, cellular specific or cell specific. And so uh, immediately people rush into developments and rush into cancer. Uh, in in terms of um, stress, resilience, response to stress, um, um, how you call that um, resistance to treatment, for instance. I mean, this is just the beginning, it's just the mm -hmm. beginning because, and, and again, there will be a lot of um, surprise, I guess, 
Um, for me, one of the most striking surprises was really coming from uh, uh, Peter's work last year, where for the very same, so we are not talking even in, in terms of expression level or in terms of one zero, uh, this link RNA is there or not. We are talking about how this RNA is and isoforms. Now everybody's going into isoforms with these long reads. Um, and also the processing, poly A tail, just the poly A tail. You have a poly A tail or not. It changed everything in mm. terms of the function of the RNA. Mm. Um, so there is a lot. But to come back to your question, um, there is not too much uh, in, the, in, the, in this field of stress uh, yet. There is uh, some papers and, and some stories, but people really went into the development. And uh, so coming back to, to brain, for instance, Except the circular RNAs that have been really the big hits in the in the in, in this field, it's not too much. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. Merci. Okay, it looks like we can get one. Um, Hanson Hay asked, "Are are these post ray urine? How about plasma EVs?" Ah, yes. You have to invite me in one year. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> Yes, so we don't we we are doing some some of these experiments right now, um, looking at the plasma. And there is a lot of work and publication on that, um, but again, uh, to be sure of what we say properly, I mean, there is a. I think the your field is really moving very well into clear characterization of what people do and should do, and uh, so yes, but there is a lot to do uh, on long RNAs. Uh, for the plasma, yeah, or the blood in general. Great, thanks, thanks, Anthony. And, and um, so, I guess related to the question is that, uh, and uh, I, I believe that you know, in the localized uh, disease, the plasma samples might be, um, you know, very limited in in in, in terms of you know, identifying biomarkers. But uh, I wonder whether you have tried metastatic patients, um, which you might have higher chance of getting the tumor fraction. Yeah, I guess yes. You're absolutely right. We we um we we have started a collaboration with Clotilde on this aspect to uh, to see a little bit more, um, but we have to be sure of what we use as a as a technique of extraction and the robustness of these extractions and uh, the quantity um, of RNAs is uh, slightly different from urines. Is fantastic for that. Fantastic. You have tons <laughs> of urine. <Right. laughs> of, uh, <EVs. laughs> Um, and actually, I went back to the paper of Peter Mesdak also on this, um, uh, what he called the, 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 the Atlas, uh, what his name, I don't, I don't know, but uh, he, he, he mentioned the fact that tears are the best, tears, the, the quantity of RNA, could, so it's not EVs, but extracellular RNAs in tears, this is where it has a lot in terms of concentration, so this is, uh, this is fantastic. I see. And lastly, just a comment is, uh, um, you know, I'm glad that uh, um, the uh, function screening we did and um, that you can find a good overlap there. Um, so those screening we, we show in that paper is only for uh, 1500 genes. And so now we have expanded that to uh, 10,000 genes. So if you're interested, uh, you know, do a further comparison with the more larger scale compare screening, I'll be happy to chat. Great idea. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, we're we're a couple minutes over, but if it's okay with you, Antonin, we have I think one more question from um, Patricia. Uh, Patricia, would you like to to ask? Uh, just a general question about uh, the storage condition to to study the RNAs in EVs, because um, most uh, protocols suggest PBS. It's okay, but there is some article presented this year, which shows that RNA has uh, we have lost with uh, in this uh, PBS in condition storage. Um, what are you sh your suggestions about this when we are trying to start to study with uh, those uh, low, uh, low no coding? Low no coding, yeah, so I can give you um, my feeling um, so, so what we do in our case is that uh, as soon as the urines has been uh, extracted from the patients, 
I mean, produce the urines, we don't extract it. Um, uh, we, 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 we take the urines uh, directly at four degrees and uh, they are prepared the day after. So uh, vesicles are uh, collected uh, within one day. So we don't wait too much. Um, now in terms of experience, so, the only, so this is what I can say. Uh, the point is that we, we started also to test um, the, 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 the stability of these RNAs. Um, uh, if you put RNAs into uh, your vesicles, on your vesicles, with or without protein as proteinase activity or with or without detergent. And we have done transcriptome and look what we have. And uh, being in an RNA lab for a long time, um, if you put an RNA in a tube and you want to study RNA, you destroy everything in gels, in your machine, every, everywhere. So it's really something that you don't want to have in the lab working on RNA. But if you put RNAs on uh, EVs and you do a transcriptome, it's just amazing. They are, they are, it's exactly the same transcriptome with some variation, it's exactly the same transcriptome as if these RNAs within the EVs are really, really well protected. It's only when you put the detergent that you destroy the transcriptome and we have done the experiment. So for me, we, we are really into a bubble that really are, is, is fantastically uh, stable and that will uh, probably resist for a few days on the bench um, or after extraction in, 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 in blood. The, the, the issue is that you have cells that generate EV. So the stress will, will change, not the EVs itself, but the population of EVs. But uh, in urines, um, it's okay. All right, thanks everybody for the questions. Um, if you have any more questions, I'm, I'm sure you can uh, feel free to reach out to Dr. Morian. And thanks, Dr. Morian, for the, the, the great presentation. Thank you very much. And a Merry Christmas to everybody. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.